thank you guys so much for that nice welcome, and it's good to be here in New Zealand, you know. I, uh, it's been 10 years. Uh, I came to New Zealand 10 years ago, had the privilege of speaking at Parachute. I know some of you might remember that. We had 22,000 people there. When I spoke, I gave an altar call, and so many hands went up, they could not count how many thousands of people gave their hearts to the Lord, you know. Never will forget that. And, uh, but I haven't been back to New Zealand to do a tour in 10 years, and i got to tell you, this is just absolutely full on. I, uh, I'm really excited just to be here and to be able to bring the good news of Jesus Christ. That's, that's what I'm here for. I'll tell you, I, uh, I have been traveling all over the world, and I've had the privilege to do this for the last 20 years. Okay, I have not, didn't just get saved yesterday. I guess I'm kind of a veteran being at it for 20 years now, and i got to tell you, in the 20 years that I've traveled around the world, I've seen some bad news. I've seen some good news. Uh, the bad news is racism and hate and wars is at an all-time high, okay? And uh, the good news is, is that Jesus is still the answer. He's still the answer. And, uh, and that's what my whole life is all about. So I count it as a privilege. I met uh, Pastor Phil Pringle. Uh, in Australia a couple of years ago, and uh, he had me come speak at his church, and he said, I want you to get out into the C3 churches. He goes, and I want you to get out and start telling people this testimony. You know, Phil Pringle is an amazing man, and uh, this man is, uh, he's, he's got a heart for soul winning. He, it's all about evangelism where he's concerned, you know. So, uh, I, Pastor Steve, Pastor Tom, I'm so glad that you guys would have me in your church, and it's good to be in a C3 church here, and, uh, you know, that's what I like about C3 churches. There's nothing religious about them. It's all about Jesus. It's all about relationship, not religion, you know, and stuff, and that's what it's all about, you know, and so, uh, you know, people can keep their religion. That's man-made, man-made rules and man-made ideology. I have a relationship with Jesus. That's what changed me, the power of the Holy Ghost, and uh, so I came tonight with a, you know, I've had a lot of death threats. I've, um, I, I'm under constant uh, harassment and things like that, but they say, do you carry a weapon in New Zealand? I said, yep. I came over with a weapon. It's called Pentecostal fire, you know. <laughs> and I said, I guarantee you, if they want to play games, I get the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I promise you that. So, uh, and that's what it's all about. Listen, y'all, again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I uh, have a few items. I'll just get the commercial out of the way, then I'm going to get right into my story. But I got a few items you might be interested in. Um, so this is probably my most requested item that I have. But um, people, I've had the privilege that most preachers don't get, and that is to appear on talk shows. I don't know if anybody in here is Jerry Springer junkies and Oprah junkies and all that. If you are, I'll pray for you after the <laughs> service. But, um, but I've had the privilege of going on most every talk show you could think of. I've been on Oprah, Jerry Springer, Phil Donahue, Queen Latifah. How many of you know Queen Latifah had a talk show, you know, and stuff? She's quite a character, I guarantee you. But uh, Ricky Lake, uh, several of them, and uh, they've asked me to come be on their shows. And uh, I take every opportunity I can. When somebody invites me on a talk show, I say, absolutely, I'll be there. Because I may be the only Christian they ever invite to be on that show, and I'm going to use it to glorify Jesus to the millions of viewers, you know. And anyway, people who's hooked on Jerry Springer, they need Jesus anyway, you know. So, <laughs> so um, but anyway, I put together, minus the Springer show, we won't go there because I don't want to talk about what happened on there. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, this is a double DVD set, and it's got several hours long of talk show after talk show after talk show that I've had the uh, privilege to be on. And uh, there's a few bonus things on there. Uh, there's a country and western group called Montgomery Gentry that heard my testimony. They made a video called Some People Change with a country song they wrote about my testimony. And it went to the, one of the top ten videos in America. And uh, that was like uh, last year. And so that's already, that's included on here. But this is several hours long, and that's available after the service. I have my testimony on DVD if anybody likes what they hear tonight. And you couldn't get somebody to come to church. Wild horses couldn't drag them here. The best thing to do if you really want to get them saved, get my testimony, take it home with you, invite them over for dinner and a DVD. And don't feed them till they watch the DVD, you know. <laughs> Because they'll be challenged to give their lives to Jesus, you know. So if you feed them, they'll get up and leave. So they'll stay as long as they know there's food coming. I know that. And uh, part of my testimony, a lot of people already know, they probably heard that at one time I was the most notorious gang leader in America. 
of the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, I was delivered from that, thank God. But uh, something else I was known for, I don't know, over here in New Zealand, some people may watch something called WWE Championship Wrestling, you know. A few people probably heard of it, you know. You might have heard of pro wrestling before. But uh, back in the 1980s, I used to rule the wrestling ring known as Johnny Angel. I was the Arkansas heavyweight champion for the National Wrestling Federation, National Wrestling Alliance, and the UWF and a few other groups. And uh, a lot of people said, well, when did you quit wrestling? I said, in 1988. I wrestled for six years. And uh, they said, I wish we could have seen you wrestle because I quit wrestling a lot long before most of you were born, you know. And uh, so I said, uh, well, you can now. I've got the best of Johnny Angel on DVD, you know. <laughs> the thrills and spills of championship wrestling, chairs fly, fists fly. It's really anointed, okay. So uh, yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that's available. And I got a new uh, CD out called Bound for Glory. It's got several songs. Most people don't know it, but I try to sing a little bit, you know. And uh, so that's on here, and we had that done last year, so you can get all that after the service uh, over at the table. Um, uh, anyway, uh, what I thought I'd talk to you about tonight, thank you, is uh, my testimony. I deal with racism because I am an expert at racism because I'm someone who lived it. You know, in America, we have a group called D.A.R.E., which is designed to keep kids off of drugs. And what they do is they send former drug addicts into the schools to talk to the kids. Now, not someone who's been off of drugs for a week, okay, but someone who's been off of drugs for a good proven amount of time and they've got victory in their life where drugs almost destroyed them, but they was able to overcome that and get their act together. So they go talk to the young people because, you know, if you want to learn about how to get off drugs, you could talk to someone who's read about it in a book or you can talk to someone who's actually been there. And, and had the life experience. So that's what, that's what they do. Well, I started doing this several years ago. The reason I went on the mission bill was several different reasons. But I started going out and speaking out, not only in the schools, but the churches and community groups and things like that, because I believe that people need to learn about racism, and who better to talk to someone who's actually been there, done that, and overcame it. Okay, and so that's what I do is I use my life experience. Now, the, the bad news is the Ku Klux Klan... White power groups are on the rise all over the world. In the United States, since the election of the Obama, in the United States, they have had a quadruple in membership of white supremacist groups. These groups have got well over one million members. They are armed. They are getting ready for what they would call a total all-out war in the United States. Some of these groups, the FBI is almost gone on high alert. They're in panic over these organizations. They're monitoring them. We're watching them and stuff. And that's something you don't see a whole lot about on the news. But I work with the FBI today. I guess speak for the FBI. I cooperate with police agencies all over the world. And I know what these organizations are all about. And they are monitoring these groups right now because people out of fear or joining these hate groups. Now, Dr. Martin Luther King once asked, why do people hate one another? And he said, men hate one another because they fear one another. They fear one another because they do not know one another, and they do not know one another because they are separated. See, if we separate ourselves from people we don't know, we have a fear of what we don't know, and people hate what they fear. Now, it isn't just the United States that has this growth in these hate groups. It's also spread all throughout Australia and right here in New Zealand. Now, a lot of people have been shocked. I, I've had media, and I'm really shocked that some of the media have asked me, you mean the Klan's here in New Zealand? And I go, listen, when I was over here 10 years ago, the Klan was here, but why wouldn't you think, well, we just don't have a problem with racism in New Zealand? That's what they've told me. And I go, well, are you an ostrich sticking your head in the sand, you know? I said, because I said, the truth of the matter is you got the National Front. You've got, the, uh, you've got the New Zealand Pride, skinheads. You've got all these different groups. And these are white power gangs. And there's, there's also one operating right here in this city and things like that. And I want to tell you something. These organizations, although they may appear to be small and they may not have, I don't know how many members they've got. I doubt if they've got millions of members and things like that. But the truth of the matter is, even if they're small, a few small people have the tendency, have a tendency to cause a lot of damage. When Adolf Hitler first came on the scene with the Nazi party, he had 2,000 followers when he was arrested and people heard about him for the first time. The New York Times wrote an article in 1923 that said Adolf Hitler is a man that should be ignored. Said his organization has no more than 2,000 people, described them as boy scouts playing at war, having an outing, and that Hitler was no threat. Ignore him and the nutcase will go away. 
That was the New York Times, 1923. Ten years later, Hitler took over Germany and almost destroyed the world, and 14 million people lost their lives, including six million Jews roasted in the ovens of Auschwitz, Dachau, Buchenwald. Ladies and gentlemen, George Santayana once said, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. We have to remember the mistakes of the past, and we have to confront it. So in order to confront racism, I don't care how small or how big it is here in New Zealand, people need to get united in each community, and they need to be aware of this, and they need to come together, and they need to know how to fight it. But you've got to understand it. A lot of people don't understand, why would someone hate someone? Why would someone become a racist? Well, it is a learned response. Proverbs 22.6 says, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is older, he will not depart from it. Hatred is taught. No baby comes on this earth automatically hating somebody. I know what I'm talking about because I was born and raised in a little small southern town in Oklahoma, and the first time I ever saw a black person I was five years old because the town was segregated. The whites lived on one side, blacks lived on the other, and people just didn't have anything to do with each other because they feared one another. And when I was five years old and I saw a black person for my first time, I was with my father, and I said to my dad, I said, look, Daddy, there's a chocolate-covered man. I go, that man's made out of chocolate. And I'm going, chocolate man, chocolate man. And I'm jumping up down on the seat and yelling that out the car. And my dad's laughing, takes a puff off of his cigar, and he goes, boy, that's not a chocolate-covered man. That is a, and he used a horrible racial slur to describe this man. From that point on, every time I saw black people, I thought of that name. Now, it wasn't just my father teaching me racism. The whole doggone family was teaching me racism. And other kids in the neighborhood, they had those same beliefs, so their parents were teaching it to them. And so everybody had all these racist feelings. But did they call themselves racist? No, they did not. Did they call themselves white power, white supremacist? No, they did not. They didn't use terms like that. I never heard terms like that. It was just to them, it, to, it was just a way of life that was being taught. I was taught to fear black people, that all black people hated white people, that all black people would hurt white people, all black people would steal from white people, and you better lock your doors at night or they'll come in and steal your color TV set, you know, or your radio or something like that. And so these are the type of things that I was taught as a kid. So I had all these misconceptions about blacks because I never took the time to get to know them. I wasn't allowed to because I was told to stay away from them. Again, Dr. King was raining what he was talking about when he said people hate one another because they fear one another. People hate what they fear. So I had all this fear in my heart when it came to black people. And uh, I came from a middle-class home. I wasn't living in a trailer park out there with a family that was sitting around, you know, not working and drawing off the government. That's not what my life was all about. My dad was a hard worker. My dad worked hard. He provided for his family. And as a result of that, I had more toys than a kid can want. I had the nicest clothes. I was popular, had lots of friends, lived in a nice home. And I kind of felt like Will Smith on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air sometimes, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know. Well, maybe not that far, you know. But, uh, but anyway, you know, I mean, I felt really good about myself. And, and uh, you know, I just thought that I, I was that kid with a silver spoon in his mouth, thought I could have what I wanted when I wanted. And I was spoiled because of it. I was the type of kid, you know, I'd be out at the grocery store if I was around my grandma or my mom, and if I wanted something, they wouldn't give it to me. I'd hold my breath and throw myself on the ground, you know, and kick and yell and stuff like that, you know, till I finally got my way. I didn't do that around my dad. I knew better, you know. My dad had a belt, and he knew how to use it, you know, and stuff. So, you know, I didn't want my hind end warmed up, you know. So I knew better than that. But, uh, but you know, I was that spoiled kid that was always causing trouble and do whatever I wanted to do. But then, all of a sudden, uh, you know, things began to happen in my life. There's a little change here and there. When I was nine years old, I was in church. We, there was a church across the street, and I went to church, and, uh, and a preacher told me that I could have eternal life with Jesus Christ if I would give my life to him. So I went to the altar at nine years old and gave my heart to Jesus, and on June 28th, or, or I'm sorry, July 28th, 1968, I was baptized. And, uh, and after I was baptized, I mean, I went to church every single Sunday, I went on Sunday morning and Sunday night. I went on Wednesdays. I joined the church basketball team. I just, I just wanted to be around church people. I wanted to know about Jesus. And this went on for the next couple of years. But all of that changed two years later. My mother, my mother was an alcoholic, and she also was hooked on drugs. My mother was a washed-up country western singer. She had lost her career because so she, she couldn't leave the drugs and the men alone and things. And she cheated on my father all the time. 
And my father, because he, he worked out of town all the time, and my father, he, he, uh, he had already had one failed marriage where he lost four kids, and he had four more kids by my mom, but then things got so bad between he and my mom. My brother Larry, he joined the Army at 17 years old, and my sister married at 16 just to get out of the house. And so that left me and my younger brother. And then things got really worse. My mom and dad was fighting all the time. And finally, my mother drove my father into bankruptcy. And my father was faced with losing everything that he had worked all of his life to get. And when I was 11 years old, my mother walked out, left, left him for another man. And I watched my father take a 45 caliber pistol and put it to his head and pull the trigger. He blew the whole top of his head off right in front of me when I was 11 years old. And that was one of the most horrible things that an 11-year-old kid could see his own father do. And when I saw that happen, I was splattered with my father's blood, and my father's body was laying there on the ground. My life, from my dad making that wrong decision to pull that trigger, he changed, he changed the destiny of his children forever. You know, I don't think he was thinking about what was going to happen to his kids when he did that. And, uh, but uh, my mother, right after the funeral, moved her new boyfriend into my father's home. He came in and took over, and she told her she didn't want her kids and told us to get out. And so she sent my little brother away to go live with my grandparents, and I wanted to go with them. But my step-grandfather never liked me, and he said that I was a bad kid from the day I was born. And he would take the good kid, which was my little brother, but he said, I'm not raising the bad kid. And so he didn't want me raised around my little brother, and he felt like we should stay separated. So he refused to let me go with him, and I was sent to go live with my sister on the streets of East Los Angeles, California, and East L.A. is the worst possible place that a kid could grow up at. Today, it's gang-ridden, and it was gang-ridden in the 1970s. You had all these different gangs that were at war with each other, and now I was in the ghetto where everybody was poor. And I was no longer that nice little middle-class kid that had anything he wanted. Now I had no money whatsoever. My sister couldn't stand me. But my sister only allowed me to come out there because she wanted the money I would get from my father's inheritance, and she took thousands of dollars away from me. I never saw a penny of it, and she used it all on drugs. And so I never saw it. I had nothing that my father had worked all of his life to leave me. My sister used it all on drugs and partying, and I got nothing. And there I was on the streets of, of, uh, of, the streets of L.A., and I was being chased by gangs. I was being beaten up all the time. I had no friends. I was so poor. I only had like two pairs of shirts and two pairs of pants to wear. And some kids made fun of me because they see me in the same clothes all the time. And I tried to tell them I couldn't afford nothing else, but that just made it worse and things. And so my whole life was just absolutely in turmoil. And I knew I was the kid that nobody wanted. And I felt rejection because my father had left this earth by killing himself. I felt rejection by a mother who didn't want me. Felt rejection by a grandfather who wouldn't have anything to do with me. Felt rejection by the teachers in school who told me I was dumb, stupid, and ignorant and I was going to end up in jail. I felt rejection by a sister who was treating me like garbage and letting her boyfriend use me for a punching bag and all this kind of stuff. I felt rejection all the way around, and I didn't think I had a friend left in the world. And at 14 years old, I was seriously thinking about killing myself so I could go be with my father. I had those thoughts of suicide. But let me tell you something. You know, suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. But a lot of people don't realize that, see, you know. And, and, and I didn't at the time. I was thinking if I kill myself, I could get off this earth, and I don't have to worry about it a thing anymore. I don't have to worry about not having any friends and feeling all this rejection. And I was at the lowest point that one could be at when I met someone from the Ku Klux Klan. And this man told me, he said, the word Ku Klux Klan stands for circle of family. He said, that's what we're all about. We're an eternal circle of white brotherhood and family. He said, I can tell you're smart and you're intelligent. You've had a horrible life, son. Nobody should go through the things that you've went through. Nobody should have to put up with that and see all the things that you've seen at such a young age. But he goes, I can tell by talking to you, not only are you smart and you're intelligent, but you'll be a future leader for tomorrow. So he goes, if you'll come join the Ku Klux Klan, we'll be your family. We don't let anybody join the Klan. You don't choose us, son. We choose you. And I'm going to give you the opportunity to become part of the master race, be part of the, something that's the most fraternal, royal order of an organization you would ever want in, in absolute brotherhood. And you'll never have to be afraid of these gangs anymore. You'll be protected for the rest of your life and all this kind of stuff. He's sitting there telling me all these things. And at 14 years old, absolutely. I shook his hand, and I said, yes, I want to join. And I joined the Klan Youth Corps at 14 years old. Now, let me say something to you. 
It could have been any gang. It could have been any type of cult that came along and offered me acceptance, and I would have went with them. And I'll tell you what else could have happened. It could have been somebody, because I quit going to church after my father died. I didn't have no use to go into church anymore. I just kind of, and not being around the word and stuff, I created my own God in my own mind. That's what happens if you don't keep, if you don't learn about Jesus and keep that filled up inside your mind and in your heart. And it could have been someone could have came along and started explaining to me what Jesus is all about, and I would have went right back into the church. But nobody was out witnessing, see? And that's why it's important. Let me tell you all something. The youth of today is tomorrow's future. The youth of today, what you see here tonight, I see mostly young people tonight, and you guys are the future politicians. You guys are the future loan officers of the bank. You're the future police officers. You are the future leaders of the community. You're the future pastors. The future is in your hands. So therefore, it's up to the adults that's just a little bit older if they want the right type of values and they want to take New Zealand in a direction that glorifies Jesus Christ and take the world into a direction that glorifies Jesus Christ, then it is time for the church not to wait for the youth to come into the church, but to take the message out there on the street and take the word of Christ out there to people. And that's why you see a group in here tonight is because people in this church had enough sense to go out there and say, hey, man, come out and compel people and put on meetings like this, you know, because it's all about change. But in order to do that, you can't wait for people to come to you. And if people don't think that the youth is important enough to go out there and invest the right values in, then I guarantee you the Ku Klux Klan... And other groups like that, the New Zealand Pride and the National Front and groups like that, and the Mongrel Mob, all of these people, they will be more than happy to invest their values into the UC. So that is why it is important that if we want to combat the message that the gangs have, then we need to go out there and give the true message of Jesus Christ, which includes all people, every race, every nationality, from whatever walks of life it is. When Jesus went to the cross, he died for all people. For God so loved the world that he gave his own only begotten son that whosoever, red, yellow, black, white, brown, male, female, rich, poor, Jew, or Greek, whosoever, whosoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so that's what the word of God's all about. But you see, I didn't know that. So I made the wrong choice. And see, today young people think, well, I've talked to young people. They go, I'm young. I can afford to make bad choices. I go, no, you really can't. Because you see, the choices that you make today can affect you for the rest of your life, even if you're 14. Because that choice I made at 14 affected me for the rest of my life, even today. And because I made the wrong choice. So, because of that choice, I set out on a journey. Now, I thought that I found my, my uh, calling in life, and it was going to be a racist clansman for the rest of my life. I felt like I was part of that order, and that's the way it was going to be. And for the next several years, that's what I did. I taught racism. I learned as much of it about it as I could. They taught me to hate people who I never had a problem with. I didn't even know what a Jew was. Didn't know anything about Jewish people. Never met any Jews as far as I was concerned. But they gave me books and literature, and then I found myself hating the Jews because of all the books and the literature that they gave me. And I go into their speeches and listen to all these Klansmen get up there and start hammering away and giving all these radical speeches and giving me more and more stuff. And you keep filling your mind up with that garbage, sooner or later you start believing it. And I started putting that inside my mind. So that is the making of a racist. Hatred is a learned response. Now, along the way, though, now what I did is I got back to Oklahoma I started recruiting other people, and they liked the way I recruited, and I started getting promotions, and by the time I was 20 years old, I was the youngest state leader in the history of the Ku Klux Klan. I took over the whole state of Oklahoma. Now, eventually, a few years later, they would make me as their national spokesman, Imperial Wizard. But before that got there, I was in charge of the state of Oklahoma, and I felt important. I had 50- and 60-year-old people calling me sir and had police officers that joined the Klan. I had business owners that joined the Klan. I had mothers with their children joining the clan, and whatever I wanted, whatever I told them to do, they did it because they looked at me as the boss, and I had all this power given to me. And all I kept thinking was about how all those people that told me I'd never amount to anything, I kept thinking, I wish they could see me now. I've got power. And I don't care if people hate me. I've got power. That's what I was thinking. And, I, and people did hate me. I was, there's two different types of KKK members. Some of them hide behind the sheet, and you never know that they're a member of the clan unless they choose to tell you. And then the other type of clan members are the ones that actually show their face on TV. 
They'll get out there and they need Klansmen to speak on television so people know who to contact. So I would go out and I'd do TV interviews. I found myself on the front pages of the newspapers. I was doing radio shows, the whole bit. And I wasn't ashamed. I told everybody I was the leader of the Klan. And so I became a household word. And I would be out shopping and people would see me coming and go, there's that evil guy. That's that guy that's the head of the Klan. Get away from him. He'll have you killed and stuff like that. And people would grab their kids and they'd walk away from me and things, you know, and I'd hear that. But it didn't matter to me, see. It didn't matter to me because I had my people. I had my homeboys. I had my homegirls. I had all them people around me that all was joining the clan. So it didn't matter to me that I, all I, was, I was on this little power trip, see. And I, and, and I thought that I was really, I thought that I was really amounting to something because I had yes people. But I had actually, I had ran from God. But you know what? If the sheep gets out of the pen, the Bible says a good shepherd will leave 99 if he's watching over 100 of them. He'll leave 99 to go back and find that one sheep that's straight off and do everything he can to bring that one sheep back into the pen. And so here I was running from God, and, you know, I left and forsook God, but the Bible says God will never leave you nor forsake you. He put people on assignment to try to bring me back into the fold. And people were coming up to me, and I would be out shopping or something, or I'd be in a mall, and somebody would walk up and go, excuse me, are you the man we saw on TV from the KKK? And I'd say, yes, I am. Would you like a card? And they go, oh, no, no, we're not interested in joining your group, but we do want you to know our whole church knows who you are, and we're praying for your soul to be saved and all that. And I go, all right, thank you. You know, all that stuff, and I'd walk on. And so, you know, so this is the kind of stuff that people were saying to me. One night, some guy called me up, 1 o'clock in the morning, my phone's ringing. I pick up the phone, I go, hello, and he goes, are you Johnny Clary from the Klan? And I said, yeah, and he goes, I got to do something for you. He goes, Lord Jesus, forgive this man of his hate and his racism, and I hung up on him. And then he calls back, and he starts speaking in tongues, you know, so I, I hung up on him again, you know. And I mean, I'm telling you, people are coming across, and, and one time I was being protested by a group of religious people, and they were letting me know that God did not love me that I had already committed the unpardonable sin by being a Klansman, and that I was going to burn in hell for all eternity. And they were calling me names, and they were marching around with their Bible scriptures and all that stuff and going, he's going to hell, and I go, you're fixing to get punched, you know, and all that stuff. <laughs> and, you know, because I said, I'm getting tired of it. I'm thinking about coming over there and whipping you. I said, you know, and I, and, uh, and I was ready. I thought, man, just call me a name one more time. About that time, this guy appears in front of me, and I knew there was something different about him. He had a glow on his face. And he hands me a tract, and it simply said, Jesus loves you. And I looked over there, and I pointed at the people who were calling me names. I go, hey, man, before I can say a word, he goes, I have nothing to do with those people. He goes, I'm not with that group at all. He says, I just came to tell you that Jesus does love you. And he turned around, and he walked off. And I remember I was smoking a cigarette, and I was looking at the track, and I was watching him walk down the street. And I thought, too bad all Christians can't be like that guy, you know? And that's what I was thinking. Well, I didn't think I'd ever see him again. Well, a few weeks later, I had the television set on. And I go, hey, there's that dude that handed me that tract. And he was walking up to people that nobody wanted to talk to. He went up to prostitutes. He went up to thieves. He went up to homeless people. He was going up to gang members. He was going up to junkies on the street on Hollywood Boulevard in California. And he was handing them tracts and telling them Jesus loved them. And he was lugging a great big giant wooden cross with him. Well, he carried that cross all over the world over the years. And in America last month, they released a movie in all the theaters called The Crosswalker about this man. His name was Arthur Blessed. He even came here to New Zealand and carried the cross from one side of New Zealand to the other and everything. Now, I never got a chance to talk to him again, but that man handed me a tract, and what he did, he planted a seed. Each time someone came up and said, our church is praying for you, they planted a seed. Isaiah 55, 11, God's word never returns void. You may not see a harvest right off the bat when you plant the seed of God, which is the word of God. You may not see a harvest right off the bat, but sometimes there's a delayed seed reaction. Sometimes when a farmer plants seed, he don't see a, a growth for sometimes two or three years. And all of a sudden, the seeds take forth and they start growing. He goes, wow, I forgot I planted those three years ago. Well, that's what was happening. See, people were planting seed. I wasn't getting saved right then, but people was planting seed because they cared about my soul. And they, more importantly, was listening to God when God put them on assignment to go witness to that man. See, go tell him about Jesus and things like that. People were calling me and things like that. You know, I remember one guy called, you know, and I go, oh, you're out of jail now, huh? You know, that stuff, and he goes, I just want you to know I'm a born-again Christian. I go, get out of here, man. You ain't no Christian. 
yeah, yeah, man, I'm praying for you. All right, bye, click, you know, and stuff like that. And he calls me back and goes, I'm still praying for you, you know. So I hear things like that all the time. People writing me letters saying, I became a Christian. I'm praying for you and all that. And, and my grandmother, my grandmother, she looked like Granny on the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> Little old short woman. And she was fiery. Now, it broke her heart when she would open up the newspaper and, and, and see her grandson on the front pages of the paper from opening the Klan and running some Klan rally somewhere. But her friends would call her up on the phone, and they'd say, why don't you disown? Isn't that disgraceful, that grandson of yours? Why don't you disown him? And my grandmother said, don't you ever tell me to disown. That is my grandson. I don't care what he's done. He's still my grandson. I will not disown him. And if you want to be my friend, don't you ever tell me to disown my grandson again, or I'll come over there and put my foot in your backside, you know. And that's the way my grandma talked, you know. She took on several people. She'd punch you if she couldn't witness to you and get you saved, you know, and all that stuff. So anyway, you know, she was sitting there, and she goes, I'm going to, she goes, she goes I, I, you know, and she goes, that's my grandson. I'm, you know, he'll, he'll come around someday. But it was a different story when she'd see me. What in the world's the matter with you, you stupid idiot? She goes, belonging to that stupid KKK. She goes, I ought to go out and cut me a hickory switch and wear your rear end out with it, you know. And I go, you ain't whipping me with no hickory switch. I'm the leader of the clan, and I'm 20 years old. She goes, don't you tell me. And she'd go out there in the yard and try to pull the whole tree up out of the ground and whip me with it, you know. And I'd sit there, and I'd give her a great big old clan speech, and I'd say, the true Christians are the Ku Klux Klan. We're the Aryan warriors. I'd give her all that white racist garbage. And she'd sit there and listen to it, and she'd turn beet red and grab her Bible and go, well, I'll just go pray for you. And I'd hear in there saying, Lord, I didn't, I, I, I'd never dreamed my grandson would turn out that way. Please forgive him for being so stupid. And all that, you know, and I'd get mad and I'd believe. I'd say, I'd quit telling God I'm stupid. I'm going to quit coming over here, you know, and stuff. And, oh, I'd get so mad at her. But she continued to keep praying. See, one thing I like about grandmothers that's, that's born again, they are the best prayer warriors I've ever seen. They will bombard the gates of heaven to get their grandchildren saved, you know. They just don't give up. And my grandmother refused to give up. She believed that God's word holds true. So she continued to pray around the clock for me. And other people were praying for me, you know. But then I was fixing to encounter somebody that I didn't, I, I didn't quite know how to deal with. And I got a call to appear on a national radio show and debate one of the nation's top black civil rights leaders. And he was a friend of Dr. Martin Luther King's, and his name was Reverend Wade Watts. He was the president of a black civil rights group in Oklahoma, and he even pastored a black church. And they called him to come to debate me on a national radio show. Now, the word prejudice means to prejudge. You judge a whole group of people by the actions of a few. So the blacks that I had seen were the militants that came out and, and, and protested the Klan rallies and wanted to fight us, and we wanted to fight them. So I figured that's the way all black people were. So I thought that when they said they was advertising on the radio the first time in history they was going to have a Klan leader sit right in the chair, right there at the same table next to a black civil rights leader, and let them go at it on the radio. And so I'm thinking, okay. What's going to happen is this guy is going to, you know, I'm sitting there thinking I'm ready for this militant. I figured he would come bopping in off the street with a great big giant afro this big. And I figured he'd have a pair of black sunglasses and a, be wearing an African dashiki with bones hanging around his neck. I figured he'd have a great big button on that says, I hate honkies. I figured he'd come walking in there with a great big boom box on his shoulder with double speakers, dancing through the door, playing the theme from Shaft, you know. And I figured he'd pull a switchblade on me and go, I'm here to cut me a cracker tonight, you know. I hate crackers. You hear me, white boy? Black is beautiful, baby. Now, that's what I thought I was going to see, and I thought the minute he starts that stuff, I said, I want the fights on. I said, they better have security to protect him because I ain't going to put up with it. So I'm sitting there waiting for him, and all of a sudden they go, here he comes now, and I'm going, oh, boy, here we go. All of a sudden the door opens up, and I'm in shock because then walked an old black man with gray hair, wearing a suit and a tie, and he's carrying a Bible with him. And he walks up to me and goes, Hello, Mr. Clary. I'm Reverend Wade Watts, and I just come here tonight to tell you that I love you and Jesus loves you. <laughs> well, that caught me off guard, see. I, I, I wasn't expecting that. And what, even got, what I, I didn't expect was I just broke a Klan rule, too, because the Klan rule book says the physical touch of a Negro is pollution. So white people are not to touch black people. And I jerked my hand back and thought, oh, my gosh, I just shook hands with a black man. I'm looking at my hand. Now, that was an insult, you know, to him. But he didn't let that get to him. He looks at me and he goes, don't worry, Johnny. It won't come off. <laughs> I 
And I said, you no good, sorry, black, bleep, 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 you blankety blank, so-and-so, you. And he looked at me and he goes, God bless you. <laughs> he goes, Johnny, I love you and Jesus loves you. And he just kept on and kept on, you know. I'm praying for you, Johnny. And so after the, uh, after the meeting, I walk out into the lobby, and his wife is holding a, holding a little baby girl. And this little girl, you know, she could tell she was like half white and half black. And he said, Johnny, this little baby here, I just want to show her to you. He says, uh, this little baby here had a white mother and a black father. They were just 16 years old. They couldn't take care of this baby, so... Uh, the parents of the white girl said, we're not raising a black baby in our home. And the parents of the black boy said, we're not raising no white baby in our home. He said, so Johnny, this baby was being punished and rejected by both families because of the color of her skin. Well, Johnny, the thing about it is she couldn't choose two white parents or two black parents. She had to take what life gave her. So how's that the baby's fault? And why punish the baby over something she couldn't help? He says, Johnny, he goes, when I saw this little baby, I didn't see a black baby and I didn't see a white baby. And I'll tell you what I did see. He said, I saw a baby. I saw a human being that needed a daddy to love her. So I said, if you guys don't want the baby, give her to me. And they gave me the baby, and I went down there, and I adopted her, got the paperwork on her. Johnny, this is my child. I got 13 children. This is mine by choice. He says, Johnny, she's just a beautiful little baby. She wouldn't hurt nobody for the world. She couldn't. So I got to ask you something. How could you hate this little baby? This little baby? She don't hate you. And I looked at the baby, and the baby looked back at me, and then the baby smiled at me. And, you know, just like, and just for a second, I started to go, look at that cute little baby. And then I remembered who I was. to go, get away from me. And I started walking away. He almost had me. And I started walking away, and he goes, Johnny, you remember one thing. No matter what you say to me and no matter what you do to me, you can't do enough to me to make me hate you. He goes, I'm going to love you, and I'm going to pray for you, whether you like it or not. <laughs> I said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll see about that. So the Ku Klux Klan started harassment against him. We went to his house and marched around out there in front of his house with white sheets and hoods on, thinking that would scare the daylights out of him. He called the police, and he said, Sheriff, the Klan's out here in front of my house. The sheriff said, well, have they done anything? They got just as much right to walk the streets as you have, boy. The sheriff was one of us. So he wasn't about to do anything. And he was sitting there laughing about it. And we're out there, come on out here, boy. So he said, well, the sheriff ain't going to help. I'll have to take matters into my own hands. So he walks right out there because God didn't give him the spirit of fear, 2 Timothy 1, 7, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. He walks right out there and faced the Ku Klux Klan, one old black man, and he goes, what you boys doing with them Halloween costumes on? This is not October. If you want trick-or-treat candy, you come back in October like everybody else. Until then, I'm going in and going to bed. Good night, KKK. And he went back in there and he shut the door. And the clan just stand there looking in shock, saying, what did he just say? And all that, I said, I don't know. He thinks he's being funny, but I said, I got another plan. Now, when the clan burns a cross in front of someone's house, that's a symbol. Leave town. Move. Don't let us have to come back. It's a threats and intimidation. That's why the Klan burns crosses on people's lawns. So I said, let's go have some fun. So we lit a cross across the street from his house. What does he do? Comes outside. And he says, did you boys bring enough hot dogs and marshmallows to go with your barbecue? He says, if you're hot around that fire, I got iced tea for you. Come on over here and get some. <laughs> so we turned around and left, you know. And I said, man, I said, I'm tired of messing with him. So the next phase was set his church on fire. So we tried to burn his church because the Klan believed that black churches were not places of worship, but were places where black militants were storing guns and ammunition to use on white people. And they didn't consider it places of worship. So they go set fire to the church, and then they got the fire out before the place was destroyed. And I said, watch this. I'm really going to scare him now and call him up and disguise my voice. And I said, hey, boy, you don't know who this is. But we're watching you. You better be afraid, boy. We're coming to see you real soon. It may not be today. may not be tomorrow. But see you soon, boy. And he goes, hello, Johnny. <laughs> he said, a man like you takes the time to call me. I'm so honored. <laughs> 
He goes, well, since you took the time to call me, I better take the time to do something for you now. One good turn deserves another. Lord Jesus, please help, Johnny. <laughs> that boy is looking for attention, and he's trying to get it by burning crosses and dressing up in them dirty old white sheets and everything else. He says, Lord, I want you to help this boy and show him your love and give him all the attention he wants from you, Lord. And I went click and I hung up the phone, you know. I said, how dare him start praying like that in front of me? I said, I've had it with this guy, you know. So, I mean, you know, now Reverend Watts, he was using love whenever he could, okay. But also, he was also a man of justice. Whenever the Ku Klux Klan broke the law, he expected the police that if the police didn't do their job, he went over their heads and got some higher police to do their job. And he, went, he finally went to the highway patrol, and he told the highway patrol, he said, the police will not do a thing about it in the town I live because Johnny Clary has them in his hip pocket. Those cops will do whatever he tells them to do, and he goes, I'm getting tired of it. And so the highway patrol said, well, we'll just see about that because they were the state police. And they said, well, we'll see about that. Let's go on down there and let's see how powerful Mr. Clary really is. And the highway, and then we're out there intimidating Reverend Watts. He was supposed to be speaking one night. And I'm out there with a mega horn. I got all these clans with him. I said, come on out here, boy. I got some watermelon for you. Come out and get your watermelon, boy. And all of a sudden, the door opens up, and here comes the highway patrol. I turned around, and my buddies were running. They were all the way back to the truck. And they were jumping in the trucks, and I said, hey, wait for me. Took off running. He goes, hey, Johnny, where's the watermelon at? And all that stuff. I said, I thought you had some watermelon for me. Come on back here. And those cops said, get back here, boy. I want to talk to you. And I'm just taking off, you know, and everything. And I mean, I'll tell you, he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't going to play. And finally, I said, you know, I, and I, everybody said, maybe you ought to leave that man alone. I said, no, I'm not leaving that man alone. I said, I win. I win. I'm getting tired of this. And I'm getting upset, and I was dreaming about him at night and everything else, you know. And so, uh, so, then, uh, so, then, so then one day, somebody said, well, we got a surprise for you. They said, we just saw Reverend Watts going into Pete's Barbecue. I said, let's go, boys. We took 30 of us down there into this restaurant. And we went through that door of that restaurant, and everybody's sitting in there, you know, and he's trying to eat his lunch. He wasn't bothering nobody, but that's real brave, isn't it? 30 Klansmen going in there after one old black man. Now, that's the way gangs operate, you know. They'll never do one-on-one. They've got to have their homeboys with them, you know, because I know, because that's the way I had to be. So I go in there, and I surround all the, I surround the, the table with the Klan, and I said, hey, boy, we don't want you here in this restaurant. We only want white folks in here. So I said, you better take my warning and you better take it good i'm going to make you a promise you better think real hard before you touch that chicken because i promise you we're going to do the same thing to you that you do to that chicken so he picked up the chicken and he kissed it <laughs> well when he kissed that chicken i looked up and everybody in the restaurant was reacting the way y'all just did including the Ku Klux Klan. They said, you got to admit, boss, that was funny. He got you on that one. I said, every one of you, get outside right now. And I ran the Klan outside, and I was threatening to suspend them and take their sheets away for two weeks, you know. I said, you don't laugh at something like that. I am your leader, and that is not funny. And then all of a sudden, the horn honks. I look up, and Reverend Watts is driving off, and he smiles. He goes, bye, Johnny, bye, King, 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 and drives off. And you know what? We never bothered Wade Watts again. See, Proverbs 10, 12 says, hatred stirs up dissension, but love covers all wrongs. See, I found out years later, he knew the black Muslims and the black Panthers, and they offered him help. They said, if you've got problems with Clary and the Ku Klux Klan, just let us know, and we'll come down there, and they'll be, we'll bring our guns, and there'll be rivers of white blood all over the streets. And he goes, oh, no, I don't need your help. He goes, I got all the help I need. God plus one is the majority. He chose to believe in God. He chose to release this word and put it to work. Proverbs 10, 12, hatred stirs up dissension, but love covers all wrongs. He spoke it forth. He believed in it, and he expected God to perform the action. In John 1, 1, it says that the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word is God, and when you speak forth the word, you release the power of God upon society. And this is exactly what he did. He spoke the word of God. He believed in the word of God, and he became the first black man in history to defeat the Ku Klux Klan single-handedly with a little help from you-know-who. You know, a lot of help from you-know-who. So, so after that, you know, he kind of took the wind out of my sails. I never saw the Klan quite the same way after that. 
And I got into pro wrestling, and I lost my career in pro wrestling. I became the heavyweight champion of Arkansas, wrestling on television. Started doing really good. I was feuding with Sergeant Slaughter, and the National Wrestling Federation was fixing to sign me to a major contract, put lots of money behind me. And I was finally going to hit the big time when the Ku Klux Klan said, we want you to go be on the Oprah Winfrey Show. So I go get on Oprah Winfrey thinking nobody watches Oprah but a few black people. How stupid was that to think that? I go get on Oprah and brag about being a member of the Klan, and my contract was tore up and mailed back to me, you know, by the National Wrestling Federation, and there went my contract right out the window, and my wrestling career was over. And the Ku Klux Klan said, don't you worry about a thing. We got big plans. You're getting requests for speaking engagements all over the place. See, Oprah had cut a deal with the KKK. Now, a lot of people think Oprah is this great woman, but let me tell you something. Oprah called up the Klan. I was there. That's how I got on her show. She wanted the Ku Klux Klan on her show, knowing that if a black woman had the KKK on her show, her ratings would go through the roof. And so she says, you know what? It's a ratings thing. You'll help my ratings, and I can help you. I got a lot of viewers, and she goes, and if you be on my show, you can give out your address, and everybody can, you know, get information about the KKK. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. So the Klan entered into an unholy alliance with Oprah. And so there's where it was at right there. Ladies and gentlemen, Oprah's not a nice person. Oprah's about this right here. Matter of fact, Oprah Winfrey says there's several ways to get to heaven besides Jesus Christ. That shows you how nice she is, you know. But the whole truth of the matter is, is that's the type of thing that she did, and I was there. That's how I got on the Oprah Winfrey show. And so I go on Oprah, and I do all that, and that destroyed my career in wrestling. And so, but I, I did it myself. It was my choice. Oprah didn't destroy my career. I did it. And all that stuff, you know, because I made the wrong choice. And the Ku Klux Klan said, that's all right. You got speaking engagements. Don't worry about the wrestling and all that stuff. And so they ran me for Imperial Wizard. And I won because they wanted a professional wrestler to be their national leader. And so I won the election. And I became the first pro wrestler that was the leader of the KKK all across the nation. And I started traveling around. I thought, okay, I'm going to do this, do this, do this. But then I found out I was not in charge of that organization like I thought I would be. The Grand Dragons and the board, they did the ruling, and they was more or less dancing me around like a puppet and telling me, if you don't like it, we can always make changes. And all of a sudden, I found out that I became nothing more than a tool for these people. And along with becoming the Imperial Wizard, I started getting blamed for everything under the sun. Whenever a law was broken and whenever the FBI was after someone, they came and knocking on my door. The Secret Service came to visit me. The CIA was watching me. All of a sudden, I became a target for just about everyone, and death threats were more than what you could ever even imagine. And then I fell in love with a girl, and I thought she was the greatest girl on the face of this earth. She was everything I ever wanted, and man, she was just like me, full of racism and hate and all this kind of stuff, and rodeo girl and riding horses and all this kind of stuff, and she was with me 24-7 just about. And then all of a sudden, it turned out she was an FBI informant sent in to pretend to be my girlfriend. They sent her on assignment, go in there, pretend to be his girlfriend, get your hand on all the information, find out who's back in the clan, get your hands on the secret files. She got her hands on all those files and turned them over to the FBI, and people who had been secret supporters of the clan for years were now being harassed by the FBI. They were, their names were being leaked to the media. They started losing their jobs and careers and everything else. And all of a sudden, people said, how in the world did this happen? Well, the only people that would know that, and they started looking who had access and come to find out. Turned out my girlfriend was the FBI informant, and she was the plant. She went into the secret witness protection program when it all was revealed. So I felt like I had been stabbed in the back because I was absolutely in love with this girl. And I thought, how could she tell me every day how much she loved me and all this kind of stuff and then just be putting on an act? And basically, she was doing her job. So, man, I mean, I thought, what in the world is happening here? And all of a sudden, my little kingdom that I built began to fall apart, and it began to tumble down. People were getting arrested all over the country and doing stupid things, and I was getting blamed for it, and I didn't even know what was going on. The Nazis and the skinheads came along and started saying, you can't trust Clary. If he couldn't even tell the girl he was in love with was an FBI informant, then how can you trust him to be the leader? And they were bringing all this Hitler stuff in and talking about, uh, talking about killing all the different races and overthrowing the federal government and inviting the federal government to a war. The FBI, if you invite them to a war, you got a war. The FBI will be glad to oblige you. 
And so the FBI, they decided they want a war. They're going to get it. I mean, there was gun battles taking place across the United States. White supremacist compounds are being raided. Helicopter SWAT teams, the whole bit. I was being drugged into court and being hit with court summons left and right. And I started thinking, man, I just can't believe that all this is happening. And finally, a policeman who was a good friend of mine, he came to visit me. And he said, Johnny, I've got some inside information. He goes, the FBI has been talking to some cops about planting drugs on you to get you off the street and get you in prison. And I said, I don't even use drugs. That ain't going to fly. They go, it doesn't matter. You try to convince a jury of 12 men and women to take the word of the leader of the KKK over a policeman's word. If a cop pulls you over for a routine traffic stop, and this one I want to tell those of you, if there's anybody here tonight that belongs to a gang and you think gangs are cool, you know if the police want you off the street, all they got to do is find one cop on the take that will pull your car over, search it, and say, ooh, look what I found, and pull out a bag of drugs, and you're gone because no jury will ever believe your word over a policeman's. And I knew that. As powerful as I thought I was in the Klan, all it would take is one cop to say he found drugs on me even if I never touched drugs in my life. And that was it. I'd be gone. And I started thinking, well, let me see. I gave up a career in pro wrestling. I gave up relationships. I gave up friends. I gave up having a normal life. And now am I ready to give up my freedom and spend it in prison? Do I want to spend the next 20, 30, or 40 years of my life sitting in a cold, gray cell and all that stuff? And I started thinking, would prison be the best place for the leader of the Ku Klux Klan, seeing how 80% of the prison population was black? And I don't know about you, but I didn't relish having my cellmate be some guy that looked like Mr. T and thinking that I looked awful pretty and I was going to be his wife. You know? <laughs> not me. Uh-uh. I don't go that way, man. I'm a straight hitter, not a switch hitter, you know? <laughs> so I sit there and I go, I said, this ain't going to happen to me, you know? So I sit there and I go, you know what? I've given up everything, but I'm not ready to give up my freedom. I said, to heck with this. Let somebody else be the leader. I wasn't going to quit the Klan. I just put in my resignation. The minute I resigned from being the leader, they all turned on me and said, all right, that proves it. If you was a strong Aryan warrior, you'd be glad to go to prison for the white race. That's what a true man will do. I go, then you go be a true man and go to prison for the white race. I said, I ain't going to prison for nobody, sucker. I said, there's more to life than going to prison just to prove how macho I am. And all that stuff, I said, I ain't going to prison for nobody. They said, well, then you're a race traitor. And you're an FBI informant. You're a double agent for the communists. And they all started that kind of stuff. So anyway, I walked completely away from them. And I got to tell you, now I didn't have any friends. I had all the blacks hating me, all the Jews hating me, all the Mexicans and all the Orientals hating me. But now I had the Klan, the Nazis, and the skinheads, the hippies, and the communists. Everybody hating my guts. And I became a man that was an island, and nobody liked me. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm carrying a gun on me everywhere I went. I'm wondering when the next person's going to try to take my life the whole bit. I'm getting all these threats and everything. And I thought, that's all right. I'm not in the clan anymore. At least I can get back into wrestling now. I went back. Wrestling wouldn't even speak to me. All the promoters were hanging up the phone on me. They go, man, you're too much heat. Can't even talk to you. Bye. And all the people I got into wrestling, they wouldn't even help and try to put in a good word for me or nothing. I found out I didn't have any friends whatsoever. Then I walked in. I thought, well, the bar rooms would hold the answer because I had this emptiness and I needed some fulfillment. So I hit the bar room honky tonks and started drinking. Met some gal sitting in a bar one night and dated her for a few weeks and went and married her. Two months later, I came home and things was missing, like my watch and my wallet, my furniture, my bank account, and everything's all cleaned out. Addy old sucker, she got the gold mine, I got the shaft, and I'm broke, you know. And I'm sitting there, they're fixing to take my home away from me. I'm fixing to lose my car. The repo man's looking for my car. They're fixing to shut off all my bills. And I had to face reality. I was fixing to be a homeless person on the street. No jobs for me, no nothing. Nobody wanted anything to do with me. And I started thinking, you know what? I couldn't handle the fact that I would be sleeping underneath a park bench, being some old hobo out on the street, and have people walk by and say, see that old drunk over there with a wine bottle in his hand that's begging people for money? You know what? He used to be somebody. That used to be a powerful man. I couldn't have, I, I couldn't. They look at the big man now, uh-uh. I said, that's not me. I'm not going to let that happen. So I decided I would follow in my daddy's footsteps once and for all. So again, that spirit of suicide came back. And I decided I was going to kill myself, so I wrote a suicide note to my ex-wife. I put one bullet in the gun, and I decided to end my life. And I looked over, and there was a Bible, and I kind of snickered, and I said, well, it's too late now for no Bible. I said, I promised God that I would serve him years ago, but I walked away. God wouldn't forgive somebody like me. But I set down the gun, and I picked up the Bible, and it fell open to Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son. 
And I started reading about a young man that walked away from his father and blew his money foolishly on wine, women, and song. And when his money was gone, he found himself in the pig pen, broke and dirty, and in there eating slop of the pigs. And I said, man, I think I know the feeling here. And when he finally realized that the men who worked for his father lived like kings with a roof over their head and plenty of food, he decided, well, I'm going to go back home. And maybe I'm no longer worthy to be my father's son, but maybe he'll take pity on me and make me as a hired hand. So he, be, he went back home a much different uh, picture than that proud, arrogant young man who went away to see the world. Now he's back ragged, dirty, and filthy and couldn't even afford a pair of shoes. And when his father seen him coming, he didn't run him off. The father ran up and threw his arms around him and welcomed him back into the house and said, my son who was dead is now alive again. And I read that story over and over again. And as I read that story, I got on my knees, and I'm not ashamed to tell everyone here tonight, this ex-gang member, ex-clan leader, ex-pro wrestler, ex-barroom brawling tough guy, I was on my knees crying like a little whip pup. And I was saying, God, I said, I got nowhere else to turn to. I got nowhere else to turn to. I said, if you'll help me, I promise you I'll go to church. I'll straighten up, God, but I need help. I don't know where my next meal is coming from. I'm trying to cut a deal with God. I don't know if anybody's ever been there or not. But I'm trying to cut a deal. If you'll help me, I'll do this. I'll do that, God. I'll give you all my money. I'll do this. I'll do, you know, I'm sitting there telling him everything. Oh, God, I'll do everything, you know. Uh, and, and I'm telling God all this. And the next day, the phone rang, and that was a miracle. They were supposed to shut my phone off. And the phone rang, and I picked it up, and this guy said, I heard you're looking for work. I said, yeah. And he goes, well, he goes, come to work for me. And he worked for a car dealership. And he hired me. I went out there, and I, I had just enough petrol to get there. He told me to start the next day, and I go, can I start today? He goes, yeah, if you want to, come on out. So I got in the vehicle. I had just enough petrol to get there and $1 in my pocket. I got there, and when I left there that day, I had made $700 before the end of the day was out. And I said, okay, I'm not going to be on the street now. God took care of me. God heard my prayers, and I said, that's a miracle. That is a miracle. And finally, I said, okay. I said, that's it. I'm going to keep my end of the bargain. I'm going to church. So I walked into Victory Christian Center in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is the official church for Oral Roberts University. Today it has 25,000 members. Back then it only had about 7,000, you know. I walked into that church, and there was red, yellow, black, white, and brown people. And they were all in there worshiping together and holding hands. The blacks wasn't over here, and the whites wasn't over here. They were all together. And they were holding hands. And I almost turned around and left. I said, oh, wait a minute. I'm not going to sit in here with all these different colors of people. Now, you see, you don't say one prayer and then get up. You know, I'm not going to insult your intelligence and tell you that I was hateful all my life. And I said one prayer. And then I got up and I said, okay, now I'm going to call up Michael Jackson and sing We Are the World and Ebony and Ivory with him, you know. <laughs> That's not what happened. I still had hate in my heart. As hatred is a learned response, so is love. Understanding and unity, you have to learn how to love other people. That's what the church is supposed to be about. So I walked into that church, and I almost left. I said, I'm leaving. I'm not going to sit in here with all these black people and brown people and yellows and reds and all that stuff. I turned around to leave, and God spoke to me. I heard the voice of God speak to me. Now, you can laugh if you want to, but God speaks to people in different ways. And I'll tell you how God spoke to me. He goes, sit down, shut your mouth, and listen to the pastor. I sit down, and you know what? Satan's not going to tell you, sit down, shut your mouth, and listen to the pastor, you know? Satan would never tell you that. So I sit down. I mean, I'm just, I'm just like shaking. And I'm sitting there listening to the preacher preach. I don't even remember what he was preaching on. But Billy Joe Darty looked right at me, and he said, you know what you've got to do. And I was the first one up out of my seat, and I ran to that altar as fast as I could go. I slid in, like sliding into home base, you know? <laughs> I got down there, you know? I was a lot better shape back in them days. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I got down there at that uh, altar, and then I said, oh, God, I said, there's no turning back. I said, God, you helped me. You were there for me. I said, I know it's wrong to be the way I am and all this hate and stuff, but I said, if you work with me, I'll hang with you, God. I said, so I said, uh, help me, Lord, and I'll serve you for the rest of my life. And I never, ever turned back since, and that was 20 years ago. 20 years ago. And I want to tell you something. I wouldn't trade it for all the money in the world. One year later, I'm sitting out by my condo with a new Cadillac. 
Well, it was a used Cadillac, but it was like new to me, okay? It was, oh, it was a nice Cadillac, you know? But anyway, I had the Cadillac. I'm out there by the condo, and I've got my swimming pool. I'm putting on suntan lotion, and I had a book in my hand called New ID in America. I had just made Salesman of the Year. I was making all kinds of money, and I went and got a book on how to change my name. Because I wanted to meet girls and stuff like that, and, and I, people would introduce me to somebody and go, um, what's your name? I'm Johnny Lee Clary. Oh, my God, get away from me. You devil, you. I know who you are. You're that guy on TV that was the head of the clan. Get away from me. People wouldn't even talk to me. I said, man, nobody's giving me a fair chance. Nobody, everybody's judging me by my past, you know, and stuff like that. So I said, I know what I'll do. I read where a guy named Saul of Tarsus was hated by the Christians too. So he changed his name to Apostle Paul. I got the idea from him. I said, well, if it'll work for him, it'll work for me. So I went and I got that book called New ID, and I was figuring out how to change my name. I already had a new name picked out, New ID, and all that kind of stuff, you know. And I said, man, John Lee Clary will just be absolutely, nobody will ever hear that name again. And then I go to church, and Pastor Sharon Darty walks up to me, and she says, I got a word of the Lord for you. God didn't save you out of what he saved you out of for you to sit around here in Oklahoma and be comfortable. He wants you to go tell the whole world what he did for you, he'll do for them. Then I go and I turn on the television set at home, and I saw young people, teenagers, 14, 15, 16, joining the Klan and other hate groups, the Crips, the Bloods, all of these groups. And they're on one of those talk shows, and they were fixing to kill each other, and they had to bring security to separate them. And they said, we're going to waste you. We're going to pop a cap in you. We're going to do this. We're going to do that, you know. And I'm sitting there going, my God, look at all that hate. You got to excuse me. I've been knocked around the wrestling ring a little bit. So sometimes it takes me a little while to get something, you know. But I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I said, okay, God, I see. I said, all right, God, if you want me on the mission field, I'll do anything for you. Because you were there for me when nobody else was. I'll give up this comfortable job. I'll give up all this. I'll go on the mission field. But you tell me how to get started. I don't know what to do. All of a sudden, Reverend Watts' picture pops into mine. I go, no. I said, anything but that. Last time I saw him, he was kissing on a chicken, and we burned his church. I don't want to have to deal with that man again. And it had been years since I saw him. But I finally, I quit arguing with God, and I picked up the phone and called him. And he said, you say that God's called you to preach his word? I said, yes, sir. He goes, well, how about giving me the honor of you speaking your very first time in my old black church? He said, now, Johnny, you do remember my church, don't you? And I said, um, how do I get there? He goes, you ought to know. You're the one that burned it down. <laughs> and then he went up there before the church, and he goes, church, I got a surprise for you. Next week, we're going to have the imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan come preach for you. They all oh, know Reverend Watts. Don't bring that man here. That's a horrible man. He did horrible things to us. That's a bad man. And he says, oh, now listen. He goes, I know, but that's the same thing they said about Saul of Tarsus when he became Apostle Paul, and I'm not going to rob you of the blessing. They go, we don't want the blessing, Reverend Watts. They said, if you bring that man here, we're not showing up, and half the congregation stayed away. Well, I walked in there to that church that day, and I got to tell you, when I walked right in there, you know, I was a little nervous. Now, today, I could go on almost any African-American church in the world. I've preached to them for years and years, and they are happy to see me because they know that I've got a record of 20 years of civil rights underneath my belt now where I've caused more damage against the Ku Klux Klan than almost anybody on this earth, and I'm proud of that record, and they are too. So they're happy to have me, okay? But back then, back then, I had no record to stand on. All I had was my word that I had changed, and I'd only been out of the Klan a short time. So I walk into the same church that I set fire to, I walk right up there to the pulpit, and all these black people come in and sit down and fold up their arms and give me this look. There wasn't no amen and hallelujah. And I got up and I go, I don't hate you anymore. I love you now. And instead of amen, I heard, mm-hmm. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I, I'm sitting there, and these black people just, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, right, you know, give me this look. So I'm sitting there, I'm going, God, they're never going to believe this. I need to stick with my plan. I just need to go keep selling cars. I'm going to be a car dealer. I'm going to go get me a cowboy hat, buy my own car lot. I'm going to get on television and say, come on down there and buy a car for me and meet my dog Spot and draw it out of rhinoceros or something and sell a car, you know. I said, that's what I'm going to do in my life. I said, I, God, this is crazy. No one's never going to believe that the leader of the KKK changed. Certainly blacks will never accept it, and so I just need to get out of here. And all of a sudden, I remembered something I read. Jesus said, 
if I, if I, Jesus Christ, not you, Johnny Lee Clary, but if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So I started talking about Jesus. And the more I started lifting up the name of Jesus, those mm-hmm's turned to uh-huh. Yes, sir. That's right. Amen. Come on. Pretty soon they was up out of their chairs going, come on, preacher. You preach it on a child. Come on now. Tell us more about Jesus and all that. Yes, sir. Glory to God. And I said, whoa, cool, you know. And next thing you know, blacks were up there. Yeah, glory. You know, all that stuff. <laughs> I said, gee, this is a miracle, <laughs> all that stuff. So finally I said, wow, I said, what do I do, you know? So finally I said, okay. I said, well, I'm on a row. I said, would anybody here like to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? And a little girl came forward about 15 years old, half white and half black. Throws her arms around me, tears running down her face. And she goes, I want to know the same Jesus that you know, sir. And I said, what a miracle. God, you take the leader of the KKK and change him. Have him come preach for a black man I once considered my enemy. Have me come preach in an all-black church my very first time to preach. And I said, and then I hated black kids and colored kids, and the first kid that ever got saved under my ministry happens to be a little colored child. I said, my gosh, I said, what a wonderful, what, what a miracle. But then I didn't realize what kind of miracle it was until Reverend Watts got to his feet, and he said, Johnny, how many years ago was that that we debated at that radio station? And I said, well, that was 13 years ago. He goes, you remember I asked you how you could hate a little baby, and I held the baby up in front of you that nobody wanted? I said, yeah. And he goes, well, that little baby that smiled at you all them years ago, and you took off out the door when the baby smiled at you? I said, yeah. And he goes, that little baby's that little girl you just prayed for. Wow. What a miracle. That little girl didn't have a whole lot to believe in. But that day she came to just see the leader of the KKK, because she had heard that she had seen him all of her life. She would heard about what she did when she smiled at him. So she came to see me, but instead of meeting me, she met the one who counted. Her life totally changed. She graduated two years later as class valedictorian of her high school, went on to university and got a master's degree in petroleum and engineering. I just had lunch with her a couple of years ago, and now she is married to a police officer who is over the gangs unit in Oklahoma City, and she has a job making $100,000 a year, you know. And so her whole life totally changed. And she says, Johnny, my life wouldn't have changed if you hadn't introduced me to Jesus Christ. See, her whole life was anchored in Jesus from that moment on. And, and Reverend Wade Watts and I, he, that day, see, when that little girl came forward, Reverend Watts had 13 children. All of them were saved but four. That day when Tia Watts gave her life to Jesus, the other three came forward and surrendered their lives to Jesus. And Reverend Watts says, who would ever dream I'd pray for an old Ku Klux Klansman and he'd come down here and lead my children to the Lord. He says, God is still in the miracle business. That day marked such a big change for a lot of people. That day, not only did little Tia Watts change and Reverend Watts, his children changed, but for the next seven years, a big change happened and another miracle happened. We had a true Ebony and Ivory team. And Reverend Wade Watts, he, I wasn't trusted by a lot of people. I'll just be honest and tell you that I, there's a lot of opposition when I decided to enter the ministry. And it didn't come from a whole lot of black people either. It came mainly from a lot of white people, people in my own race. Don't trust this man. At Victory Christian Center where I went, that pastor there, Billy Joe Darty, is one of my dearest friends. But when I first started going there, he had some of his staff members come up and invited me to find another church to go to. They said, we don't want you here because people know who you are and they are afraid to come into Sunday school class. They're afraid to be sitting in the same church with you. You're a hated man. You hurt a lot of people. And, uh, you know, they think that there's going to be bullets flying everywhere and stuff like that, and they don't want to come to this church, and we're not going to have somebody like you disrupting it, so we're going to invite you to find another place to worship in this town. I said, well, I just wanted to come here and learn about Jesus. They go, then go learn about him someplace else. We don't want you here. They said, if you're that determined to be here, we'll assign a group of men to privately disciple you and fellowship you for the next year or so till they see that your conversion is really genuine and that you're really for truly a Christian, and then we'll decide when you can come back to the church. I turned around to leave, hung my head down, and I thought, so this is what the house of God's all about? And all of a sudden, God said, no, it isn't. He said, are you going to let a bunch of hypocrites run you out of church? 
Are you that weak that you're going to turn around and leave this church because some hypocrites offended you? Are you that weak of a person? I chose you because you're strong. I said, that's right, I am strong. And I turn around and around and go, excuse me. I said, hold on just a minute. Before I leave this church, does Pastor Billy Joe know that you just told me this? They go, well, no, we're in leadership. We don't have to clear it with Pastor. I go, well, let's go make sure that it's clear with him. Let's go talk to him. I want to go tell Pastor what you just said, and I want you to say these same things to me in front of Pastor. They, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. We're, we're, you, don't, you misunderstand. We can't make you leave the church. We're just suggesting that. I go, oh, so you took it upon yourself, and you bypassed Pastor, and you came and invited me to leave. I see. well, I got a suggestion for you. I said, I used to be a pretty good pro wrestler. And I said, and I said, I was the heavyweight champion. And I'm feeling like right now I'm fixing to backslide. And I said, and it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. So I said, I'm about to ask you to turn around and walk away. Otherwise, I will not be responsible for what happens in the next couple of seconds. I said, don't you ever approach me again, you hypocrites. Get out of here. And they turn around and start running. They go, that's what we're talking about. You're, you're of Satan. You're of Satan and all that stuff. I go, go on, get. And they took off, you know. And I said, jerks and all that stuff. And I, and I said, you know what? I'm staying in this church. They're not running me off. And as a matter of fact, I'm not going to hide from them either. And I'd look to see where they were sitting every Sunday, and I went down there and sat right across from them and blew them a kiss and waved. And all that stuff, you know. I said, I'm staying. Three years later, Pastor Billy Joe Darty came up to me, and he said, I want you to preach. He says, on Sunday. And all that. And I said, can I bring Reverend Wade Watts with me? He goes, oh, that's a great idea. And all that stuff. And I said, all right. And but the people ended up, I'm going to tell you something. This is where God, look how God's in this. I go in there to preach in that church, and, they, and the, the um, uh, people that were against me were out there praying against that meeting. Now, that's charismatic witchcraft because they're going against what the pastor was wanting. And they were out there praying against the meeting, and they wanted the meeting stopped and all this kind of stuff. And somebody went in there and caused an electrical wiring outage on the ORU Maybe Center with $300,000 worth of damage. $300,000 worth of damage. However, however, they said the people that were praying against it, they were slapping each other five when the fire trucks got there and go, God answered our prayers. Pastor was so blind he couldn't see through Johnny Lee, but God heard our prayers. He just stopped this meeting. Praise God. But they praised the wrong God because what happened was pastor comes across the street. He said, move everybody across the street to the gymnasium. We'll cram everybody in there. We crammed 2,000 people into the gym that night, and 200 people came forward and gave their lives to Jesus Christ. So God won. God won. And those people ended up leaving the church. They quit and they resigned, got off of staff, and they left the church. And Billy Joe said, good riddance. And the insurance company gave a check. They go, not only do you need $300,000 worth of this, but you need some extra to do this, this, and this. And they cut all year at ORU a check for $1 million. And they was able to put in new carpet and all that kind of stuff inside the thing. So God actually blessed, see. And so Reverend Wade Watts and I, we sat out on a journey. He said, Johnny, there's always going to be a lot of opposition to us, but we just got to keep on going. Going. So we set out on a journey, and he and I traveled all over the United States. We started getting invitations. We appeared on Phil Donahue and all the other talk shows, preaching together and debating the Ku Klux Klan on secular talk shows. And he was teaching me what it was like to walk a mile in his shoes. God knew what he was doing when he brought that man in to disciple me because I needed to learn what it was like to be on the other side. I was being called all those wonderful little names I used to call people that I saw Reverend Watts with and the things I called Reverend Watts. Now people were calling me those names. And it didn't feel too pretty. And Reverend Watts used to say, well, now you know how it feels, don't you? I said, yeah, I do. But I said, that's good for me. I knew that. And he goes, it is. It is. But he taught me a lot of things. And one day we were, I asked him, I said, Reverend Watts, you got to tell me, why didn't you hate me back with all those horrible things I did to you? Why didn't you hate me? He goes, Johnny. Your daddy taught you to hate. My daddy taught me the opposite. He goes, when I was nine years old, I made friends with a white kid and played at his house all morning long, my first white friend. And his mom came to the door and said, y'all come on in now. I got lunch ready. He said, I went in there and washed my hands in the basin and dried them on the towel and went to sit down at the table because I saw two plates there. My white friend grabbed me by the arm and said, Wade, get up. Don't let mama catch you sitting at this table. Your lunch is out there on the back porch. This was for me and her. 
He said, sure enough, I went out there, and I sat down, and there was a dish of food waiting for me on the porch, and I couldn't understand why I wasn't good enough to sit at the same table with my white friend. Why did I have to sit on the back porch? And the dog came up barking and trying to bite me, and I'm trying to get the dog off of me, and my friend came to call his dog off, and then he said, Wade, the reason my dog is mad at you is because you're eating out of his dish. That's where Mama puts your food. He said, I went home, and I said to my dad, I said, Daddy, I went to that white boy's house to play, and his mom made me eat after a dirty old dog. Why does she hate me so much for, Daddy? I never done nothing to her. You answer me that, Daddy. I want to know how come she hates me so much. Now, his dad could have said, Son, that's the way that all white people are. Hate them all. Much in the same way that my father and my grandfather and other people taught me. But he didn't. His father looked at his son and said something that changed his life forever. Now, I want you to remember this. As my dad taught me to use racial slurs that changed my life forever when I was five, his father changed his life forever at the age of nine when his father looked at him and said, Wade, when you, as you go through life, you will meet people who will judge you because of the way you look, and they will not like you because of the color of your skin or what race you are. But always remember this, son. Hatred is a sickness. And if a man hates you, you wouldn't want to hate a sick person, would you? You want to help sick people get better. Jesus said it's not the healthy who needs a doctor. It's the sick who needs a doctor. So when you run into hate, call Dr. Jesus on him. He'll fix it every time. He'll do it every time. Johnny? He goes, that's what I did. I saw you. He says, I knew I met a young man that had been misguided, and you probably didn't have a whole lot to believe in. But now you do, because you got him. You got Jesus. And when he said that, my life changed forever at that point. I never saw things the same way again. Geraldo Rivera, some of you might watch Fox News, and Geraldo Rivera had us on, and he was talking to Reverend Watson. He said, how could you forgive Johnny Lee Clary? That man burned your church. That man was a horrible man. He harassed black people. He's one of the most hateful individuals I ever met. How could you forgive him? And he said, Geraldo, I had no choice in the matter. I had to forgive Johnny. Jesus said, if you don't forgive Neither will the Father in heaven forgive you. He said, you think I was going to let John and Clary keep me out of heaven? He goes, no way. He says, I had to forgive him. He goes, and I'm glad I did because now he's my best friend. And when he said that, he put his arm around me and Geraldo started crying. Tears began to roll down Geraldo's face. And, and I want to tell you something. Phil Donahue was even drawn to Reverend Watson. He said, how, could, how, do you get, how do you get something like this? Who taught you this do good and stuff? I've never seen anybody love so much. But you see, he was a man who truly had the love of Jesus. And he taught me what it was like to walk in the other fellow's shoes. And I was grateful for seven years of friendship that I had with him. I'm going to close with this. Ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Wade Watts and I, we cut a blaze of trail for seven years all over America. And we worked hard to bring people together. Whenever we'd hear about a KKK rally going on, we'd show up and hold a rally about two blocks away of our own. We would take ads out in the newspaper saying, instead of attending the Ku Klux Klan rally, come down to the Unity rally and meet Ebony and Ivory. <laughs> and there's a picture of me and Reverend Watts smiling in the paper and said, it will work. Reverend Wade Watts was very famous for one big quote that he made. And it's long remembered across this world. He made it up. He said, if you want to play beautiful music, you got to learn to play those black and white keys together on the piano. He truly believed that there was hope for mankind. For seven years, I had this man as my friend, and I was grateful for all those years that I had with this buddy of mine, a man who believed in me when nobody else did. I kind of figured I'd always have him around, but I was sure wrong in thinking that. His health began to fail him, and they cut off one of his legs due to diabetes when gangrene set in. But that didn't stop him. He said, well, I'll preach from a wheelchair. And he got in the wheelchair and went around and preached in the wheelchair. 
And he still wanted to preach God's word, and he refused to give up the church. He just kept on preaching, but his health got worse. And finally, in 1998, after seven years of friendship with this man, I got a phone call that he was asking for me, and I went to the hospital. And he was laying there in the hospital bed with bone marrow cancer, sugar diabetes, prostate cancer, Parkinson's disease. He was nearly blind, and they were talking about amputating his other leg. This man was in great suffering, but all he could think about, he said, get Johnny down here. I need to see Johnny. I went down there. His kids called me and said, Daddy's asking for you. I went down there and walked into that hospital room, and I saw this great giant of a man who used to march with Dr. Martin Luther King and stand up against the Klan and everything else. I saw this man, this great champion of justice, laying there sick and frail and shaken from that Parkinson's disease and in much suffering and pain. But through all that pain, when I walked through that door, he smiled. He said, Johnny, I'm so glad you came. I got something I want to give you. My evening sun is sinking fast, and this old race is finally done, Johnny. I got to go. But before I go, he says, I got something I want to pass on to you. He goes, you knew I was friends with Dr. Martin Luther King, and he had a dream that one day his four little children could live in a world where they would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Somebody didn't share that dream, and they thought if they killed the dreamer that they could kill the dream. But I made up my mind, and so did several others, that they might have killed the dreamer, but they could never kill the dream. And I dedicated my life to keeping the dream of Dr. King alive. He says, Johnny, in the Bible, an old man by the name of Elijah taught a young man by the name of Elisha everything he could. Then old Elijah went on to heaven and passed his ministry on, a double portion of it, to young Elisha. And young Elisha went on to do even greater things than old Elijah did. And then he took that old trembling black hand and he reached up from that hospital bed and he grabbed this white hand. And I saw a black and white hand entangled together. I thought of Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, nor male nor female, nor slave nor free, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. And I saw these two hands entangled together, and he says, Johnny, I'm passing it on to you, old partner. He goes, keep the dream alive. I promised him I would. I let go of his hand, and I walked out of that room, and I took one last look at him, and I saw tears running down that old weathered face. Shortly thereafter, his daughter was by his bedside, and they heard him saying, Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. And they said, Daddy, who are you talking to? There's no one else here. He goes, Don't you see him? It's Jesus. He's standing right here. He said, Wade, you fought a good fight and you kept the faith. In my father's house are many mansions, and I've been up there building one for you. Where I am, you get to be there too, so say goodbye to your kids. I'll be back to get you tonight. Right then, the nurse stepped forward and said, Reverend Watts, what would you like for breakfast in the morning? He said, oh, look, honey, it don't matter what you bring in here for breakfast. I won't be here to eat it, because you see, I'll be having breakfast with Jesus in the morning. And those are the last words the old man ever spoke. And they came back in his room the next morning and found his body laying there, cold as ice. And he had left that shell that he lived in with a smile on his face, a look of peace. I went to his funeral, ladies and gentlemen, and I never saw a huger funeral. They couldn't find a church big enough to pack everybody in, so they did it in the city auditorium. And there was movie stars, there was politicians, congressmen, senators, all these important people came to say goodbye to this man. And I, kinda, I started laughing when I saw all the big long line of limos. And I was standing there laughing, I go, wow. And I remember I looked up at the sky and I was remembering how Wade would call me sometimes and say, Johnny, I don't think anybody's listening to me anymore. I've just gotten too doggone old. I go, no, Wade. I said, you're wrong, buddy. I think you got a lot more people listening to you than what you realize. And that day I was laughing when I saw all the funeral cars and all them limos and all them important people. And I go, Wade, I don't know if you can see this or not, buddy, but I'm going to tell you, you were sure wrong, and I was right. I said, you sure affected a lot more people on this earth than what you realized. 
Look at all these important people that came to say goodbye to you. And in one way or another, Reverend Wade Watts had affected their lives. And there was important people, people. I mean, they were up there talking. And these were famous people that were saying how Reverend Watts met to him. And I, I went over and talked to one girl that nobody knew. And she was standing there. And she said, oh, I'm nobody important. But she goes, Reverend Wade Watts played an important part in my life. She goes, I'm a single mom with six kids. She goes, I couldn't pay my bills. She goes, my husband left me. I couldn't pay the bills, and they was fixing to shut off my electricity, and my babies would have frozen. And I went to Reverend Wade Watts and asked him to help. And he put on his coat, and he didn't have the money to pay my bill either, but he took his hat, and he went and knocked on every pastor's door in town. And he knocked on the door, and he goes, there's a young lady down here that's got six kids. We need that bill paid. Put some money in here, right here, in this hat. And when a pastor would he all around and all that, and he'd stick a couple of bucks in there, he'd go, uh-uh, more. <laughs> you can afford it. Get it in there, <laughs> all that stuff. And he went over there, not only paid her bill, but bought her around all kinds of groceries for her and those kids. She goes, I'll never forget that as long as I live. And that story touched my heart. I got up to give the eulogy, and I didn't know how the people was going to react because they said, who's going to take up this great man's mantle? And I got up to give the eulogy, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, I said, I know I'm not even worthy to shine this man's shoes, but he thought enough of me to pass me that mantle, and I made him a promise, and I owe that man. He believed in me when nobody else did, so I'll spend the rest of my life keeping my promise to him to keep the dream alive. People rose to a standing ovation. I was a head pallbearer, and my job was to shut the lid on the casket and load it in the hearse. I waited until everybody looked at my friend and passed by that casket, and I looked at my friend's body, laying there in that coffin, all dressed up to go away, but with a smile on his face. I patted him on the shoulder, and I said, this isn't so long forever. This is so long for right now. I said, I will see you again. I said, but it'll be a while because I'm going to spend the next few dozen years keeping my promise to keep the dream alive. I bent down, I kissed him on the forehead, and then I shut the lid on the casket, and what I did is I fulfilled another promise that was long overdue because I promised him years before whatever he did to that chicken, I was going to do to him. <laughs> it took a while, but I keep my promises. <laughs> I loaded his casket in the hearse, and I drove him out and watched him lay him down in the graveyard, and I turned to drive away with tears in my eyes because, not that I was sorrowful, but I was sorrowful only that it would be a long time before I could talk to my buddy again. And as I, I knew that he was happy in his glorified body up in heaven, and he let me know it too, in a strange sort of way, because as I drove off, I recalled the most important thing that he had ever said to me, and I forgot it until that day, and I never forgot it since. It was almost like I could hear his voice as he said, Johnny, the best way to overcome an enemy is to make a friend out of him, and he did. What a friend we have in Jesus. With every head bowed and Every eye closed here tonight. I'm going to ask you the most important question that any of you will ever be asked in your entire life. I didn't come all the way here tonight from America just to tell you a little story and go home. I came here tonight because it's all about life change. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, if you live to be 105 years old, nobody will ever ask you a more important question than the one I'm fixing to ask you. Now, you see, tonight, some of this could have affected you. Some of this could have affected you tonight because maybe you've had thoughts of suicide in your past or maybe even in your present. There could be somebody in this room tonight that's been a victim of divorce, and they've had to come from a home where there's just been absolute hate where there's been absolute hate, mommy hates daddy, daddy hates mommy type stuff, kids screaming in the middle of the night. Yeah, I've been there. It's not a pretty sight. 
Some of you may have a low self-esteem here tonight because maybe you had your own personal, say, Mr. Woodcock in school. Some teacher that told you you would never succeed at anything and ridiculed you, put you down in front of other students, and you felt about that high. Maybe you've been a victim of gang violence. Maybe you've been a victim of harassment. Maybe people have excluded you because you just didn't fit in with the crowd. Maybe you've been screwed over by people in your life, and maybe you have unforgiveness inside your heart. Every time you think of someone, you think, oh, that, that horrible person. And yeah, people are horrible, but you know, people deal with a lot of those things. And Reverend Watts, I'm sure he thought I was horrible, but he was able to look beyond that and forgive. Ladies and gentlemen, maybe I said something tonight in this that you can relate to in your personal life. Maybe I didn't. But the question that I have for you tonight is this, the most important question you'll ever be asked. If you was to die tonight, and this was your last night here on earth, are you absolutely sure and are you absolutely positive that you would go to heaven are you absolutely sure that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Are you positive that Jesus would meet you at the gates of heaven and say, Well done, you good and faithful servant. In my Father's house are many mansions. I've been building a place for you. You get on up here and come on in here and sit down next to people like Reverend Wade Watts. Sit down next to people like Catherine Coleman and Lester Summerall and Billy Sunday. I want you to sit down next to people like Keith Green. I want you to come in here to heaven and live for me forever. Are you absolutely sure that Jesus would tell you that this is your home and you are definitely going to heaven? Or would there be anybody in this room tonight that said, well, now, what do you mean absolutely sure? I mean, I can't say I'm 100% sure. No, you may be in this room tonight and say, well, I'm about 90% sure, but I'm not 100% sure. And some of you may be here tonight and say, well, I'm... I'm almost sure. I think I stand a pretty good chance of getting in. That's not the right answer either. Your answer to that question could be, well, I just don't know if I would go to heaven or not. That's fair enough, but that's not the right answer. Maybe you're here tonight, and maybe you would even go so far and say, I don't think I would go to heaven at all because I'm not living my life right for God. I'm sure if I died tonight, God's not pleased with the way I've lived my life. And I've had some things in my life I just haven't been able to get right. I don't think God would let me into heaven. Maybe that's, that's you I'm talking to tonight. Truth of the matter is, with no one looking around tonight, I want you to reflect on that. You see, I know for a fact that if Jesus can save somebody like me that did all those horrible things and give me a life to where I travel all over the world today and I believe in people and people believe in me and I can proudly tell you I have friends of every color, I have friends from every walk of life. I have friends that, that more friends than the average person on earth has, and it's all because of Jesus. And if Jesus could do that for me, don't you think for one second he can't forgive you? Don't you think for one second he can't help you? But right now, with no one looking around, this could be the last time that any preacher ever asks you this question. You may think, well, you know, wait a minute, I'm young. I've got a lot of years left to live. I don't have to worry about dying, thank God. Well, you know what? Tomorrow is not a promise, but only a chance you'll be here. I don't care if you're 5 years old, 15, 25, 35, 45, 55. I don't care if you're 105. You could go at any given second. You could leave this building tonight, and somebody could be driving irresponsible out there, not watching what they're doing, and they could slam into you, and your life could end. Are you absolutely positive that your life is right with God? Right now, countries are building nuclear weapons that threatening to blow each other up. The world is on the edge of a world war. I would not want to go one more day on this earth. One more day on this earth knowing that I'm not right with God. But you may say, well, how could I get right with God? I mean, I smoke, I drink, I've got this going on. I'm, I'm, I'm living with someone I'm not married to. I, I, I do sex, I do drugs. I do, I, you know, I, I'd have to give all that up first. I haven't given anything up, so God, no, you don't have to give up nothing first. See, that's what the problem is. People try to clean the fish, but you've got to catch the fish before you clean them. And I'm going to tell you something right now. God takes you just as you are with all of your faults. 
Jesus went to that cross, and he didn't say, you got to get rid of this and clean this up before you come to me. Jesus went to that cross and died for you. Greater love hath no man than this who would lay down his life for a friend. No one looking around, all eyes closed. If you're here tonight and you say, man, I want you to pray for me. Right where you're sitting tonight, you're saying, I want to get my life right with God tonight. I would like to, if I was to die tonight, I'd like to be 100% sure that if I died tonight, I would go to heaven. I'm not 100% sure right now. Even if you're 99% sure, but you've still got that little doubt. Maybe you once walked with God, and, and you, you once was in church, and, and, and now you're not even hardly in church anymore. Well, remember, I was too. I was too, but God took care of that. I don't care if, you, if you're 99% sure, if you're just not sure at all, or you're pretty sure that you wouldn't go at all. Whatever the case is, you've got unforgiveness in your heart toward a loved one. You remember Jesus said, if you don't forgive, neither will the Father in heaven forgive you. Right now, right now in this room, in this room tonight, if you're saying tonight, I, I would like to be sure that if I died today that I would go to heaven. I don't care if you've been in church for 20 years. And even if you're a church leader, you said, I just want to make sure. I'm not 100% sure. And I want to make sure, would you pray for me? Right where you're sitting, no one looking around, all eyes closed. Slip up your hand if that's you. I want to pray for you right where you're sitting. Yes, 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 yes. My gosh, hand after hand after hand. You got your hand up? If you got your hand up right now, jump to your feet. Come up here and stand right here and let me pray for you. If you're not ashamed of Jesus Christ and you're not ashamed of the cross, he wasn't ashamed of you 2,000 years ago. Don't be ashamed of him tonight. Don't be ashamed of him tonight. You come stand right up here and let me pray for you. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. This is your time tonight. This is your time tonight to get your life right with God tonight. To get your life. Come on. Come on. Come forward. Come forward. It's your time to get things right with God tonight. Say, man, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I know I'm going to make sure that I got things right. Don't worry about giving stuff up. Don't worry about, well, I got to give up smoking. I got to give up drinking. I got to give up that. You know, don't worry about all that stuff. What we're going to give up tonight is, is our, yes, I'm going to do things my way. We're going to just surrender everything over to God tonight. And let God take care of it. God will work all that other stuff out with you in time. Don't you worry about that. This is your time to get right with God and make sure that you're going to heaven tonight. Make sure that you're going to heaven tonight. You know what? I still know that there's more people. There's more. See, there's still more people coming. Still, there's no more people need to get right with God tonight. There's more people. So this is what I want to ask you to do. All of you still sitting out there. Yeah, this is a huge altar call. This is huge. But you know what? There's still more people. So all of you still sitting out there. This is what I want you to do. Every soul is important to God. If there had just been you on this earth, Jesus would have still went and hung on that cross and died the most horrible death for you. Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through him. Muhammad can't get you to heaven. New Age can't get you to heaven. None of that stuff. The only one that can get you to heaven is through Jesus. That's the word of God. So this is what I want you to do. All of you still sitting out there, I want you to turn to the person next to you, whether you know him or not. I want you to look him in the eye. And so turn around here. Let me just ask you something personal. Are you absolutely positive that God's pleased with you? And if you was to die tonight, are you positive that you would be going to heaven? Are you sure Jesus is your Lord and Savior? And if they say yes, go. I want you to say Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And if they say no, I'm not sure, say well, why don't we both go make sure that we're right with God and let's both go, go pray together and make sure both of our lives line up with God. Sometimes you just need a friend to come stand with you. So turn to the person next to you right now. Remember, if you answer that your life's right with God, and it's not, I'd hate to be in your shoes. If that person says, I don't know if my life's right with God or whatever, say, come on, let's go get things right. Sometimes you just need a friend to stand with you. Everybody take a step forward. Take a step forward, everybody that's up here, because we've got plenty more coming. Yep, here comes more. Here comes more over here. All right. All right. All right, come on quickly. Come on. When I was in the bar rooms and I used to drink, at the end of the night, when I'd be out there getting drunk, they'd yell, last call for alcohol. Tonight I'm yelling, last call for altar call. Come on. <laughs> Anybody else? Come on, we got more coming. Come on. It's your time to get things right with God tonight. Get things right with God.
All right, guys, you're fixing to say the most important prayer that you will ever pray in your entire life. Your life changes from this moment on, from this moment on. I want you to say this with boldness and mean it with all your heart. This is the most important prayer, and you will remember this prayer for the rest of your life. For the rest of your life, you'll remember it. Let's say this. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you tonight, and I confess to you that I have been a sinner, and I am so sorry for all of my sins. Tonight, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. And in order for, to get forgiveness, I give forgiveness. I forgive all those who have wronged me in my life, and I release them to you, Lord. They're no longer my problem. They're yours. Now, Lord Jesus, I have come tonight, and I'm standing here in front of everyone, and I confess you that I want you to be Lord of my life, master of my life, the coach of my life, the trainer of my life, and my best friend. Where you lead me, I will follow you. Whether you want to use me on the mission field, in the pulpit, in the workplace, to the family, in the school, however you want to use me, Lord, I am ready to be used by you. Now, Lord, mold me and shape me into being the type of person that you want me to be. Now that I have confessed to you before mankind, I thank you that you have confessed me before our Father, who is in heaven. So therefore, I commit to you. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray with you on a daily basis. Lord, I'm going to hang out with other believers. And I'm going to learn all I can about you, Lord, so I can have the best relationship that could possibly be had with you as my best friend. I love you, Jesus, and I am going to heaven because you said so. And I take you at your word because you are the truth. In Jesus' name, Begin to praise him right now. Give him praise. Give him glory. Praise him. Praise him. Hallelujah. Now listen. This is very important. That prayer you just made, you committed your life to God. We didn't connect to God tonight. I hear all this saying, let's connect to God. I don't like that. You know why? Because you can connect on the Internet to someone, but if that plug comes undone, you're no longer connected. But if you're committed to someone, you don't unplug. You stay committed. And you just committed your life to God tonight. And he committed his life to you by sending his only begotten son for you. You're saved. You're going to heaven. You're going to live there for eternity no matter what. And guess what? This is where it's important. The church serves as a training center. That's a training center. That's what a church is for. We're supposed to teach people love. We're supposed to learn to equip ourselves for the, for, for the advancement of the gospel. So if you don't belong to a church, let me recommend this one. If you're not going to a regular church, let me recommend this one. Get in here. Get plugged in. Let the pastors teach you all they can teach you so you can go out and share. Remember what my pastor said to me? You didn't, he didn't save you for you to sit around and be comfortable. He wants you to go tell the whole world what he did for you, he'll do for them. Go tell them. Now give him praise again. And thank you for having me here tonight. <laughs> Pastor. Okay. All right. Where's, oh, I want everybody real quick. The church has something they want to give you. Now, I think they're going to give you a Bible and give you some stuff. I don't know what they're going to give you, but they're going to give you some stuff that's going to help you in your everyday walk. If you guys would just turn around real quick and see that guy with his hand up, follow him. He's just going to go give you something real quick and put it in your hand, give you some gifts to take home with you tonight that's going to help you learn all you can about Jesus. 
Thank you so much. Just follow him real quick.